I'd like to welcome you to tonight's facts forum as it relates to the National Marine Sanctuary proposed designation for the Mid Lake region. I'm Chad Palaszczuk, the chairman of Visit Sheboygan Inc. I'd like to thank our sponsors on this event, which is Visit Sheboygan, the tourism entity for Sheboygan, as well as SEAS, the Sailing Education Association of Sheboygan. Um, tonight, Leslie Kohler, who is the chair of the Sailing Education Association of Sheboygan, or SEAS, which provides a community boating program here in Sheboygan um, on the lakefront here, uh, will be the moderator for this event. Um, she will introduce the panelists, and they will each have a few minutes to speak, and then it will be a question and answer time. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Leslie Kohler. Hi, I'm Leslie Kohler. Do you want to hear what SEAS means again, the Sailing Education Association of Sheboygan? Um, anyway, I'm glad that you're all here. I would like to introduce my panel. First, we have jo John Braham. He's a state archaeologist with the Wisconsin Historical Society. <clears throat> Next is Steve Kroll, a diver and member of the uh, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary Advisory Council. Um, Next is Mike Friss, Program Manager and Public Access Coordinator for our Wisconsin Coastal Management Program. Russ Green, who is, got lots of title, Regional Co Coordinator and Maritime Archaeologist of NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and a former Maritime Archaeologist for the state of Wisconsin. Um, after him comes Chris Sari. And she is the president and CEO of the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. And then there's our own Mike Vandersteen, mayor of Sheboygan. Um, I had the great privilege of growing up. I, have, I had the great privilege of growing up on the beach uh, in Black River. And it was really an awesome thing to be able to be a kid there and spend all the days on the beach, swimming, body surfing, canoeing, and sailing. As you might imagine, I did a lot of sailing. Did a lot of sailing off the beach down in Black River and a lot of sailing here at the Yacht Club. The Lake Michigan is an awesome resource and provides some very exciting sailing and other opportunities to enjoy the water and, um, you know, and boating in general. Um, I was part of actually this process of, of getting the Marine Sanctuary here. And in 2013, I think it was June 2013, there was a group of us that went over to Alpena to see, well, what is a Marine Sanctuary? What does this look like? Is this interesting? Would we be, could we be part of this system? Um, and we were really excited when we got over there to see what was going on and, and we're going, yeah, we need this in Sheboygan. So by December 2014, the communities of Port Washington, Sheboygan, Manitowoc, and Two Rivers sent a request to be put on the nomination list to become a NOAA Marine, San NOAA Marine Sanctuary. And there were 96 letters of support for this nomination. In October of 2015, NOAA published a notice of intent to prepare a draft environmental impact statement and carry out a public scoping process to consider designating the area as a National Marine Sanctuary. The public scoping period ended on January 15, 2016. NOAA held three public meetings and received both written and verbal comments on the concept of designating a sanctuary. NOAA received approximately 135 comments during that scoping period, the majority of which were strongly supportive of the concept of a National Marine Sanctuary designation. In January 9th of this year, based on the public comments received during the scoping period and in consultation with the state of Wisconsin, NOAA published a draft environmental impact statement, draft management plan, and proposed rules. Together, these documents constitute a proposal by NOAA 
to designate a um, 1,075 square mile Wisconsin Lake Michigan Nat National Marine Sanctuary that would protect 37 shipwrecks related to underwater cultural resources that, pos that possess exceptional historic, archeological, and recreational value. The increased area reflected the public scoping <coughs> comments, updated the shipwreck lo location information from the state of the Wisconsin. NOAA opened an 81-day period of public comments on the three detailed proposal documents. This comment period ended in, on March 31st, 2000 and, or 2000, 2017, sorry. Um, NOAA received approximately 650 written comments on the sanctuary proposal. NOAA held four public meetings during the week of March 13 in Algoma, Manitowoc, Sheboygan, and Port Washington. Approximately 400 people attended these meetings with 75 pe people providing verbal comments. Over the last four years, a number of us have presented at civic and fraternal and civic organizations. Russ Green the other, and other NOAA folk have attended city council and county board meetings, as well as a number of other venues, including meetings with the charter and commercial fishermen. This past year, Russ Green, driving some 4,500 miles, has had 63 in-person contacts with Lake, local and state government and, public, and the public regarding sanctuary designation. These include 38 public presentations with service organizations, museums, nonprofits, university classes, state partners, public comment sessions, four city council meetings, and two county council meetings. The remainder were one-on-one -on -one meetings with similar partners, businesses, and legislators including Get Into Your Sanctuary public events. This targeted outreach directly reached about 3,100 people. We welcome another opportunity to relay information about the sanctuary and answer questions and concerns that the public may have. I will have each of our panelists give a short discourse on their association with NOAA and Marine Sanctuaries, and afterwards we will have a public question and answer period. So I would first like to bring John Graham from Oakhampton. Hi, come on up here. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to thank all you folks who worked hard to organize this tonight, and uh, for all of you, the rest of you who decided to attend on what turns out to be a, a wonderfully warm fall evening. I was hoping my allergies would have passed by now with some nice cold weather, but um, that's not the case, so I may um, have to stop occasionally tonight to catch my breath. Um, I do work for the Wisconsin Historical Society. We are a state agency and a membership organization with um, 12,000 members uh, statewide. And for the last 170 years, uh, we have worked with Wisconsin citizens to collect Wisconsin stories and, and Wisconsin history, uh, worked with them to help preserve that and, and, and make sure it's available for the next generation and then make it available for uh, the public in as many different ways as we can figure out. As you might expect, the information that's come to us and comes to us today is much different than it was 170 years ago get a lot of electronic information and a lot of emails, uh, but in the way we present that information to the public has changed radically too. We now currently have over uh, a half a million pages of original historic materials online so that um, anybody in the state who has access to the internet can look at that. We still have the State Historical Society Museum that gets about 70,000 visitors each year. We still maintain an area research network where local folks can order materials from our library and archives and have them delivered locally. We still have uh, 10 historic sites where we entertain um, tens of thousands of uh, people each year. 
And we still work very actively with residents all across the state to preserve historic places, whether it's an old building downtown that's being rehabilitated, or whether it's a 12,000 year or old archeological site. So one thing we're re we always remind ourselves of is that most of Wisconsin's history is in private hands and in private property, and so we look forward to working with those folks to preserve that information. In 1987, when the federal government passed the Abandoned Shipwrecked Act, Wisconsin st established the Maritime Archaeology and Maritime History Program to make sure that Wisconsin shipwrecks and other um, underwater historic sites um, were documented, protected, and that that information was made publicly available. Over that 30 years, um, we think our program has been very successful. We think it's been very successful for the following reasons, that we have a very active program to go out and document uh, wrecks on a regular basis uh, and to make that information publicly accessible. Uh, we have a long history of embracing new technology. Now, I know this, isn't gonna, this is going to sound silly at this point, but we were the first program at the Wisconsin Historical Society to have a website. So, um, we just finished a project where we took some underwater photographs and turned those into scalable, measurable uh, drawings, and we think that's going to be applicable to a wide variety of folks who work underwater, but also on land. We've had a very aggressive and a very progressive public outreach program. This deals not only with public education, but in 2000 or 2001, I forget, um, uh, we invented Wisconsin's Maritime Trails. This trail lines above and below the waves. Um, it connects uh, shipwrecks, other uh, docks, historic structures, downtowns, charter boat operators who cater to taking people out on the lake, kayakers. Uh, it links uh, local museums, uh, maritime theme parks. We joke in Maritime Trails that you can, you can dive it, kayak it, boat it, drive it, bike it, walk it, or you can just sit home in the comfort of your living room and surf it on the web. What we think has made our program particularly successful over this period of time is that we have developed partnerships with literally dozens of organizations. We really recently sat down in our yearly review and put together a list of those partnerships over the last couple of years. It was four and a half pages of single space. So we think that's typical of our program, that's typical of the Wisconsin Historical Society. <coughs> One thing that we've learned over the last 30 years with our maritime program, and when we talk about it, is that maritime, Wisconsin's maritime history and shipwrecks is extremely popular. Now, you know, you would expect if we gave a program here on the lake that we would get a room full of people. But we get room overflow crowds wherever we go. Inland, on the lakes, um, we do programs in the Wisconsin Central Sands area and we get room crowds full of people. What we've also discovered is that um, shipwrecks are particularly fascinating to young people. We can go into a classroom of, of disgruntled eighth graders or uh, high school students and by the end of it, they're fascinated by it. <clears throat> we don't expect all of them to become maritime archaeologists or maritime historians. But what we do think it does is we think it introduces them to the lakes, the importance of the, the lakes in Wisconsin's history. But perhaps more importantly, it's a great way to talk about the role that the lakes play in, in um, the economy in Wisconsin today and in all of your communities. We think having uh, the National Marine Sanctuary staff in Wisconsin is a great thing because they have technologies that we don't have access to and um, we will not have access to. Um, this last summer they had a boat in the area that was doing some bottom land mapping and looking for shipwrecks as part of that. Um, we have never done that in our program. We simply don't have the technology to look for wrecks and we don't have the staff. But really, that type of uh, information is really critically to managing these historic places and talking about them. We think having sanctuary staff here will give us access not to just that type of technology, but other type of public outreach technology and to 
of NOAA staff across the U.S. so that we can bring programming from the West Coast or the East Coast or the Florida Keys into classrooms in Wisconsin and into local communities. In addition to that, we think establishing this sanctuary will give all of you and all of the communities along the coast here the opportunity to talk about all of the great things you're doing and all the things that your communities can offer and do that on a national level. Um, one th other thing we've learned over the years is that uh, if you want to be effective in public outreach, and particularly in public education, you really need to have some people on site and in those communities on a regular basis. So we think having a sanctuary staff in this area will really give us and give students here an opportunity <coughs> to work with scientists across the U.S. I'll be honest with you, we're looking at this too. For the opportunity is that we're going to be able to redirect and redirect some of our energies to other places in Wisconsin. We are, after all, a statewide program, and so there are some things we'd like to do um, on the inland lakes and rivers. That does not mean we're going to abandon this section of um, the Great Lakes to the NOAA sanctuary staff. Um, we are dedicated to co-managing this with them. Um, Russ doesn't know this yet, but we've got lots of great projects that he's going to help us on. And so, uh, you know, we're looking forward to working with him on that. We think it's going to give us a great opportunity also to work with all of the people that we've met through this process. Uh, we started doing programs with the Port Explorium in Port Washington. Um, we're going to look forward to working with the um, uh, Spaceport here in Sheboygan on a more regular basis. So we think this is, this is going to be a great opportunity. When we uh, learned about uh, the possibility that the, sanctuary, the Marine Sanctuary Program might expand in 2006, uh, we really felt we had an obligation to look into that and to investigate it and to see if there was some spot in Wisconsin that was nationally significant and if the program was something that fit for us. And so, um, we did that background research. We think we have an area that's, na we, we know we have an area that's nationally significant. And based upon that, we went out and started to talk to people uh, about this program and um, what we thought it might do and how we thought it might benefit us and NOAA. And that really um, resulted in the nomination that was sent uh, to the sanctuary program in December of 2014. So uh, we've been involved in this from the beginning. I don't know how many people and how many organizations we've talked to um, since uh, 2007 about this. Um, I really, we really haven't kept track, but we've been in this area and talking to people on a regular basis throughout that time period. So look forward to the uh, comments of the other folks on the panel tonight and then to your questions. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, my name is Steve Kroll. I'm from uh, Rogers City, Michigan. Uh, I work with the National Marine Sanctuary only as a volunteer. I've done so for quite a few years, uh, probably more than my wife wants to count uh, because it does take me away, but fortunately uh, my wife's here with me on this trip. Um, I was a, uh, to say, uh, to undersay it, I was a no know a person myself. And that was something that uh, I look back on had some benefits for the sanctuary program, I think. But for the most part, it took a lot of convincing on their part to get me here today to talk to you. And some of those things you may not uh, think about, but I think uh, my saying no to Noah was probably one of the best things that has ever happened to me because I, I went to those meetings and uh, after a while, uh, after the nomination, I put in an application to be on the Sanctuary Advisory Committee. And I thought and talked to my wife about it and I said, you know, this is never going to happen because they know that I am a 
no NOAA person, and so why will they ever consider putting me on the advisory council? But lo and behold, <laughs> they did. And uh, I always tell people they put the fox in the chicken coop, you know. And I was going to protect divers' rights, and this sanctuary was not going to take them away from me, and the government is not really going to be here to help me anyway, so I'll just make sure that I'm very vocal about it. But as I went to those councils, one thing that impressed me was that our sanctuary advisory council, even though it had no real etched in stone, they got to listen to what we have to say, the fact of the matter is, is that everything we said, they paid attention to and did. We created Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. 30 of us, 15 members and 15 uh, alternates. We represented a large, diverse population representative of what Alpena had to offer. We had the diving group, which I was on, and even the, the guy that was the member for the diving group ahead of me, and I was his alternate, he was a naysayer to know also. Um, and we were there just to protect diving rights. We wanted to be able to dive our shipwrecks. And we wanted to not have to pay any fees for it. And if that happened, we were going to do I don't know what else. Probably be out with signs, you know, which I saw on my way in today. I, I, I think those people out there with those signs are, are going to end up being some of your best assets, just like I am today, because they have good ideas, too. They have questions. There's nothing wrong with questions. Questions that can't be answered, then that's a reasonable, you know, question to ask. If, it, if you can't verify and answer that question, as long as they're willing to listen and believe the answer when it's there, uh, you know, it's a good thing. When that kind of thing stops, so will the value of your sanctuary. Because you won't, you won't change with time. And that, this is a living kind of thing you're talking about doing. This will change with what you want it to become. This is a bottoms-up system. When, when I was a no-sayer, it wasn't a bottoms-up system. It was a top-down thing. It was the government coming down and saying, we want to do this. Well, we got upset. The government isn't here to help you. You know that. That's just the way it is. But you're wrong about this one. As simple as I can say it, you are wrong if you are against it. You have to work with it. Your, your, your concerns will be satisfied when you participate with it. You will find that, as I did, that the biggest thing is not divers and shipwrecks. The biggest thing is that history that you have coming into your community and being part of and you reliving what your ancestors, your predecessors had to offer. And it's still out there waiting for you to recapture it. And it's very important. It'll create an identity. It'll create a, a value that you will all have in your community. And, and you'll, you'll wake up feeling different every morning. Um, I, get, I get a little tight about this. Um, so I, I made some notes here. Uh, one of the major benefits I see is that we've been able over there to do a lot with a little. I'll just put it that way. Uh, there, there are entities that want to do something. And as an example, we put in a Maritime Heritage Trail. Okay, uh, and, and there was a little bit of money here and a little bit of money there and then some groups that wanted to do something and all those little dimes come together. Now you got a little collection of dimes and then you get application for a grant and you get somebody like Russ who can do grant writing, knows a lot of the angles. Next thing you know, you've doubled your dimes and then somebody else comes in as an entrepreneur and says, you know, so-and-so, uh, passed away and I'd like to do something to mem put, 
put in a, a memorial to them, so I'll put a park bench in or something like that. And you end up with a maritime trail that runs all the way through your city. And a few years goes by and the Department of Transportation in Michigan says, maritime trail is really good, we got some money. Now it's gonna run three counties. So your imagination can become, you know, your goals. You can, you can go anywhere with this. Put 30 people in a room, give them time to think about where you'd want to be, and you'll be just as good or better than Thunder Bay is. Uh, the advisory council I served on and have served on um, wants this to happen. We don't want everything for ourselves over there in Alpena just because we got a good thing going. We want more of this throughout the Great Lakes. The reason is, is that we can feed each other information. We can feed each other ideas. We can make our community something that uh, are special. If this isn't a special place for you, then you don't need a sanctuary. But if it is a special place for you, you need to capture it, you need to hold it tight. That's all I have to say. If you have questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Um, and with that, uh, whoever's next. Well, I, I want to thank um, those who decided to have me on this panel. It's great to be in a room with folks that care so much about the Great Lakes. Um, my name is Mike Fries. I manage the state's coastal management program. Coastal management program in Wisconsin's existed for about 40 years, uh, 40 years next year, actually. And uh, we work with communities from Superior to Kenosha, virtually across the South Shore Lake Superior, Green Bay, down from Door County to, to uh, uh, across um, Wisconsin's shoreline of Lake Michigan. Um, it's, it's a thousand miles, and I probably see every inch of it twice a year. But uh, it's, it's great to get out. I, I really enjoy working with the, the communities. A big part of what we do is working um, with the networks of the partnerships that we have developed. People like Visit Sheboygan, you know, which is part of the Wisconsin Harbor Towns Association, which was a group that we helped form that was brought together the tourism, conventions and visitors bureaus, and, and city administrations of all Wisconsin's Great Lakes communities together to help promote themselves. Um, they, they've been producing uh, travel guides. We've been working with them to do things like uh, Discover Wisconsin videos. We're very proud of those sorts of investments that we've made in those. In addition to that, you know, we're really focused on the quality of life within the communities, working uh, uh, with, within those, those communities and figuring out what people want to do. Uh, work, working closely in Sheboygan, things like a, uh, um, an ADA compliance, you know, canoe launch. We worked. Um, um, in the Blue Harbor Peninsula on remediation of the contaminated sediments. We, uh, we worked on um, the, uh, the restoration of the beach, uh, Lakewood of Blue Harbor. Um, down in Port Washington, investments on the, on the, on the waterfront, Coal Dock, uh, uh, Roger Street Fishing Museum, um, work around the, the, the Twin Rivers and, and Two Rivers, and, uh, and Manitowoc. So it really is sort of focusing on you know, what, what people's visions are, helping them see those through. And with that, you know, we saw a chance of working together with, with folks, bringing together that network, like the Harbor Towns people. Actually, I think the first time that we, we, we brought it up is uh, Amy had me down here to talk, um, in the Yacht Club to talk about lake levels. And I was like, well, you know, there's this, there's this thing called the Marine Sanctuary, and that really got people excited, and Amy and Leslie were really sort of the catalyst for that. Um, um, our, our agency in the Department of Administration is really one of the focuses with, with the H Historical Society of bringing together our partner agencies together on this to talk about what it meant, bringing together DNR, our Department of Transportation, Tourism, a Board of Ministers of Public Lands, and, and a host of others, talking about what that could mean uh, to the state, how it could, we could leverage our efforts, what it means in terms of our priorities, and how we can work together on it. So it, it was, it's been really a, a great experience for us using our shared networks, you know, John, Tamara, you know, and, and Caitlin, um, my staff with, with people like, like Amy Wilson, you know, in, um, in the communities, branching out, working with the mayors and the city administrators on this and, and beyond that into the counties. So we're, we feel really proud about 
what we've done and we're always happy to talk about it and always happy to ask answer any questions you may have about it the ultimately for us is um, I have to answer to uh, to the state administration and it's and eventually it'll be up to them to decide what to do so it's important for us to be here and hear what people to say so that we can relay those uh, that information and those questions and concerns back up to the to the governor's office so with that I you know I welcome the chance to be here and, and answer any questions I can Hi, Mike. I guess I'll just introduce myself. Jeez, I thought that we had a pattern going here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, my name is Russ Green. I work for the uh, National Marine Sanctuary Program. And uh, one of the great things about marine sanctuaries is um, they only work if you have great partners. Um, so when you've got great partners uh, and they're telling a new group about National Marine Sanctuaries, I think sometimes uh, from a NOAA staff perspective, you get out of the way. So, you know, I've got a couple of things to, that I'd like to mention and then, you know, move into questions. Steve brought up a great point, which is, you know, you got to get your questions answered. That's what this forum's about. You know, we want to talk a little bit about some of the experiences our partners have had, you know, the state's um, perspective on this proposal, Steve's perspective from Alpena, uh, Mayor Vanderstein's perspective from an emerging local community that could be part of a marine sanctuary. So. Um, Again, hearing from those voices is, is, is pretty important. Um, the reason we're doing this, and again, Leslie really pointed out the public process, the number of public comments, the number of opportunities for comment, but being here tonight is about, I think, you know, getting the proposal right. Uh, and I wanted to mention where we are in that process. So we are working through all of those comments that Leslie mentioned, the, the 650 or so, working with our state partners and, and others to, to craft uh, what we call the final proposal. Now, sometimes it's hard to explain, to say, well, geez, that's the final proposal, it's done. Uh, and what that really means is it's really a final draft um, that brings all of the ideas that we've heard over these last couple of years together uh, in a final document that has a management plan that outlines um, what the sanctuary would do. You hear a word comprehensive management, you kind of wonder, well, what is that? The management plan talks about how education and resource protection and research fit into this idea of managing a national marine sanctuary. So that's part of it. The regulations are, are part of it as well. So we aim uh, in the month of October to have that crafted in partnership with the state. Um, it's very important that it's understood that this is a co-management arrangement with the state. This isn't about uh, NOAA coming in and, um, and taking control from the state, either the bottom lands or the resources. Those remain with the state of Wisconsin. Um, what it does make is a co-management arrangement that John sort of alerted, alluded to. There's a memorandum of, extent, of understanding that details that out. We're working on that now. So that, that package, you know, in October, um, we'll have that crafted in a good spot. And then it really begins the clearance process. Um, so it's not done. It goes into NOAA, uh, it goes into the National Marine Sanctuary Program, and you can imagine there's some give and take as we figure this out, and policy people uh, with NOAA come back and say, well, what do you mean by this? And so there's give and take. It goes up through NOAA, ultimately to the NOAA Administrator um, and the Department of Commerce. And so that um, review process, it's hard to say you know, how long it will take, but that's, that's yet to go. And when that's finished, it comes back to the governor of Wisconsin for final approval. Um, and so that's also so pretty important to know. So this proposal uh, is ongoing. The process uh, is ongoing. I want to mention too, uh, just briefly, that we've done this before. The last time we did it was in Thunder Bay. It was a little bit before my time. I got there in 2004. Thunder Bay was designated in, in 2000. Um, and I think from the concerns that, that I hear emerging from the communities, um, important concerns, Many of those were voiced, as Steve mentioned, in Thunder Bay. And in fact, that whole process was a public process, and that's chronicled online. So when we hear public comments, those are addressed in, in the documents that are the final documents for the Marine Sanctuary Program. And the short story is that that, that process, those sentiments, uh, are all still available for reading. And they, they make, I think, a good guide uh, to help address some questions that are emerging right now. Um, in 2014, that sanctuary expanded um, nine times. It's a big expansion. And the process for doing that was very similar to the one we're going through right now. 
um, public comment period, working with the state. Um, it's important to know that that was driven by the outlying communities of Alpena. We said, geez, we see some, some real benefits going on in Alpena. We'd like to be part of that marine sanctuary. There was a resource protection um, reason to do it. There were great shipwrecks outside of that boundary that, that defined the original proposal. Um, but it's important to know that that also um, was a public process and, and governed by this administrative process that we're in right now. So as sanctuaries evolve, um, those things are, are um, regulated and dictated in how sanctuaries change or expand over time. And, and that's, that's really important to know. Um, so I think, I, I think what I'll do is um, stop there. Um, and so we have time for questions. I've got a long list, and I hope, I hope we do get questions, because I know there, there are important concerns out there. So I'll turn it over to Chris Sari from the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation. Good evening, everyone. I want to thank um, Susan Sheboygan and Seas for hosting this forum tonight, and, and Mr. Mayor for inviting us to your great city. Really appreciate being here. Um, I really did want to be here tonight. I care deeply about the National Marine Sanctuary um, system and uh, the conservation um, and stewardship of, of these areas. I have to tell you, we almost didn't make it here. We started out this morning about 6.30 a.m. and got here about 6 o'clock um, p.m. And I know it's very dangerous to mention your college football affiliation in a Big Ten state this time. I'm a, I'm a Wolverine. I'm not Spartan, at least. I'm a Wolverine. Um, but I decided I was going to mention it because I thought there was one thing Wolverines and Badgers could all agree with, that if it took us 12 hours to get here, it could only be Buckeyes running the airlines today. So that's a little football humor, and I'll move on past that one. But anyways. Um, Similar to Steve, I'm actually a, a Michigander um, and uh, grew up on the Great Lakes and uh, really loved um, the, you know, water skiing and, and kayaking there. And uh, I'm hopeful, um, similarly, that uh, we won't have uh, Alpena and Thunder Bay be the only Great Lakes sanctuary for very long. I really do hope that there will be a designation of a sanctuary here uh, in Wisconsin and Lake Michigan. What I wanted to do is I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the national perspective on the National Marine Sanctuary System. So I was going to tell you a little bit about um, our organization and then just wanted to cover a couple of kind of key points that I'd like to leave folks with. So the National Marine Sanctuary Foundation, we were set up about 17 years ago. And just to be clear, we're um, not affiliated with NOAA. We're actually a nonprofit organization. Um, and we were set up to help um, conserve America's national marine sanctuaries and work with the community in partnerships for these areas. And we talk about them as really being our treasured areas. These are areas of national significance because of the natural resources they have, the cultural resources they have, and, and similar here, the maritime resources that they have. And so what we do for our work is our work is all about partners. We try to form a partnership between public entities and the communities and other organizations that are interested in these areas to support um, research. And that research can include um, maritime heritage and preservation research, and it can also include uh, natural, um, natural uh, resources research. Um, sometimes we do work around whale disentanglement, for example. Um, we support a lot of uh, citizen science, so really volunteer engagement uh, in the sanctuaries. Um, we aid in conservation and preservation projects, and we also help try to provide funds to support um, projects that local communities want to do in conjunction with the sanctuaries. So a lot of what our work is, is building those partnerships and helping work with communities to try to tell their story and the uniqueness about the sanctuary that they're establishing or that they've established and want to get out even more broadly to the public. So there's probably three points that um, I want to leave you with tonight. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of people have actually hit on them. They've hit on them very eloquently. First, National Marine Sanctuaries are very community driven. And I think you know, Steve mentioned it really well. There was an older process where there was much more top down. But when NOAA reopened this new process for designation, they really made it a bottom up process with communities participating by saying, we actually have an interest in this nomination. 
and then having public meetings where folks could actually talk about the boundaries and the resources that they wanted to protect. And then it goes all the way through to once a site is designated, the management process is, as Steve mentioned, being part of the Sanctuary Advisory Committee. There's 440 members of Sanctuary Advisory Committees across the country representing very different stakeholder perspectives that all participate in the management of these areas. And I think maybe what I think is even more telling about how important these are and how important community-based processes are in this, uh, across these 14 sites, 137 volunteer hours occur each year. So this is people in the community donating their time, their resources, their services to protect these areas for their children and their grandchildren. The other point I wanna leave you with is that when Congress passed the National Marine Sanctuary Act, they did it because they wanted to conserve and protect nationally significant areas. And again, it's for future generations. And the point that I wanna drive here, because I think sometimes this gets lost, these waters are public waters. They're America's waters. NOAA holds them in trust for our children, for our grandchildren, and for this current generation. These are really your waters. This is not a federal takeover, but this is about a partnership. And Congress really saw the benefit of designating these nationally significant areas. And what designation brings with it, they were recognizing that there are special places, and what designation brings with it is this opportunity for research, for education, for conservation, and for exploration. A lot of what John talked about in his remarks about how now you have partners that can actually help leverage your resources and go further. And last, lastly, the point I want to leave you with is that this is about enhancing preservation. So when um, we look at a national marine sanctuary, it's in partnership with local communities, with states, with universities, and it helps build a comprehensive plan. It almost becomes a focal point for organizing your resources and organizing your vision around. And in this case, this is going to be a very important co-management relationship with the state. And, and what I've heard and what I've seen is, again, that this is a federal takeover. And I, I want to say that's like the furthest possible from the truth on this issue. It doesn't affect private property rights. It's not taking away riparian rights. And in fact, it actually brings you into the process. And I just want to end my remarks because I was um, out in California um, at the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary this weekend. And they were actually celebrating their 25th uh, anniversary. And that was actually designated a site by Congress and uh, Secretary Leon Panetta was a member of Congress when that site happened, so we were honoring him. And one of the things that I thought was extraordinarily, given his head of being DOD and also being the head of the CIA and many other ones, was that he saw establishment of the sanctuary as one of his um, greatest accomplishments. And he saw that because he felt so strongly about democracy and he thought democracy really formed the heart of the sanctuary um, core. And that's because of this process. When Monterey was established, not everybody agreed. It was bringing together a community around what their interests were to have a discussion. And in those 25 years, it's been a very active discussion through sanctuary advisory committees. So tonight is still about, it's a continuation of that democracy that really forms a base. It's allowing us to have this discussion and sometimes we're not going to all be in agreement, but hopefully one of the things I hope I want to say that we can have, share an interest in, I think everybody in this room at least shares an interest that Wisconsin has these incredible maritime um, resources located off the shores that really tell in a very important part of the history of the Great Lakes and the history of this country. And we want to tell that story to our children and we want to engage them in that education and in that, that knowledge that we have. And if we can come together around those interests, I think we can have a really good discussion, kind of similar to what Thunder Bay did and Monterey did and other sites, about how we all work together to actually accomplish what's in our interests and how we can get to that goal working together in support of this area. So thank you. Good evening, I'm Mike Vanderstein, the mayor of Sheboygan. You know, Sheboygan has worked on this National Marine Sanctuary designation for the last four years. 
And we not only did it by ourselves, we worked with the cities of Two Rivers, Manitowoc, and Fort Washington to put uh, the nomination together in conjunction with the state of Wisconsin. Uh, it was a, a really eye-opening process to go through. You know, sometimes when we think about our community, we overlook a lot of things that, that, that other people see when they come to visit us. You know, we have a great open lakefront here in Sheboygan. Um, and things like the wrecks, you know, it's something that we know they're out there. Steve Radovan's been drive, diving on them for over 30 years, but we kind of forget about it. You know, we even ran into a wreck when we were building our marina, and uh, the State Historical Society gave us a choice. We either had to cover it up with tons of gravel so we could preserve it for future generations, or pull it out and put it on display. So we were building a marina, so we really didn't have much of a choice. We put it on display. And while it's a really unique way for people to see uh, a wreck up close, even if you don't want to get in the water, um, you know, we kind of take it for granted. The YMCA didn't like it because it blocked their view of the lake. But, but it's a, when you look at this National Marine Sanctuary and maritime history, it's going to be, uh, I think, a cornerstone of this program because we, we have one of the few uh, schooner wrecks that's actually on display on shore. Um, so I think, you know, we ourselves are uh, rediscovering some of the things that are important about our community. Uh, we also want to do some new things, just like all the other communities want to do. And, uh, you know, some of the things that we want to do is remember our heritage. Sheboygan started out as one of the major ports on Lake Michigan on this side of Wisconsin. And until the railroad came along, we had a, a really good chance to become the Milwaukee of Wisconsin. But when the Iron Horse came through, the fact that we had a really good port here wasn't as important, and a lot of that economic activity shifted down to Milwaukee. But it's, it's, uh, it's why we were, uh, were so important to, to us in, in the past. The other thing that we want to do is emphasize education, not only the maritime history to our, our, our students going through the middle school and high schools, but you know, we took that trip to Alpena and we had our eyes opened up to some of the things that they're doing with ROV competitions. Now that's a re remotely operated vehicle and they work with both middle school and high school students to design uh, an, a robot that will go underwater and perform a mission. Well, you might say that's kind of a fun thing to do and everything, but this is starting to open up our kids' eyes to maybe future careers because we are right now, um, we have 33% of our population employed in manufacturing. We're third highest in the nation for that percentage of, of our population in manufacturing. And our manufacturers are shifting from piecework to having robots do many things in their factories. In fact, Mr. Gill runs a polyfab, and he put another 50,000 square foot addition onto his, his factory, and he said, Mayor, I want to see this be a dark manufacturing area. You know, I'm challenging my employees to learn about these robots and how to uh, make them do the things that we need them to do, and, you know, we're not maybe going to hire more people, but I hope I can get those people trained to do this in my factory. So it's, it's going to help us in that effort and to be uh, an economic benefit to our, our companies. You know, some of the other economic benefits that we look forward to is increased tourism. You know, we're going to be on a very uh, uh, important list of 14 communities in the United States that that have a marine sanctuary. And the people that are interested, the people that come out for the programs that John talked about, they're going to take a look at coming to Sheboygan, Port Washington, Manitowoc, Two Rivers, and Mequon. Mequon joined us a little bit after the application process, but they're also going to be participating. We're looking to more room nights in our hotels, more visitor spending, new businesses starting. You know, we used to have two dye shops in town. We don't have any right now, and we hope that that's going to come back. I hope we'll see not only fishing charters, but diving charters. That'd be great to, uh, to take care of that. One other thing that uh, our community invested in, some people sponsored uh, an effort that Leslie led to bring the science on a sphere to Sheboygan. And uh, they invested $150,000. The science on a sphere is a NOAA program, and it goes in a room, and there's a big globe that's all white. That's your screen. 
and then there's four projectors in the corners, and they can make that globe look like any planet. They can show all kinds of different data sets of information on Earth. So you can show uh, an earthquake, and you can show the seismic activity and where it affected it, and then you can show the, the resulting tsunami so that you can illustrate that to the kids and give them something really interesting and fun to do. But like I said, there's over 500 data sets of information that are available with that. Now we has that, had that housed at Spaceport, and you know that Spaceport's looking for a new home, and so that's temporarily in storage until those things are worked out. So, you know, I hope we bring a little clarity to some of the discussions. I hope we can answer the questions that you have and give you some assurances. And I, I hope that in the end, you can support this marine sanctuary. I think it's going to be very important for our community. And I know that it all comes down to what does it mean to me? What's, how is it going to affect me? And I hope you'll find out that it's really not going to be a problem for you and that we can all get together and support this and make it great for our community. Thank you. So I thank the panel for those words. And uh, so some of you might be going, well, so why does Seas care? And uh, so Seas and Visit Sheboygan are, are, are hosting this this evening. And Seas, yes, we teach people how to boat. And that's, you know, our, one of the primary things we do. But we're also very interested in our maritime heritage. This community has a very strong maritime heritage. We used to build boats. We used to be a major shipping center. And of course, as a, you know, we're, I'm interested in sailboats. We need to, you know, it's interesting to see what the old sailboats look like and how they plied, the, how they plied our inland seas and transported our goods. And it's a very exciting story. But I also think that um, I think, as Mike said, you know, this can be very important for the community as an economic driver. I will tell you that a decade ago, um, any of you could have come to me and said, you know, in the next decade, Sheboygan is going to be internationally known as a world-class holder of regattas. And a bunch of you don't know what regattas are, maybe. But anyway, we hold world-class racing here, and we are known internationally. And uh, you know, I mean, it's it's a crazy thing. If you're not involved in the sailing world, you don't know how significant that is. But it's huge. It's really huge. And so many things can change significantly over the period of a decade. And things that people never really ever would guess you know, that they could be in addition to the community. We have this awesome waterfront. It's, it, we have one of the most beautiful waterfronts anywhere. I mean, just really bottom line, it's gorgeous. And, and we're so lucky to have this resource. So Visit Sheboygan is very much for this project and sees this. So I'm gonna take this microphone and I will go around and take questions and uh, I'm going to start over there because that was the first hand up. I thank you very much for the opportunity to ask a question and uh, um, a lot of great comments. Um, I've got a lot of questions, as other people might, but obviously there's not, you know, enough time, you know, to answer all, you know, all the questions. So my first question is. If some of us have some questions that don't get answered here that this evening because of time, how can we get you know the contact you know information you know of the people on the panel you know if we want to uh, you know, ask for for more data? That's a great question. Uh, I have a big stack of business cards here, and I'd be happy to talk to talk to you anytime or present at a at a, at a group for sure. Oh, I imagine they do. I'm, I'm in Sheboygan, actually, so I, I'm here. Uh, I can be available anytime. Yep. And, you know, I wanted to mention, too, um, that the, the director of the Northeast and Great Lakes region, Reed Boney, is with us tonight. Thanks for being here, Reed. Um, <laughs> so he can answer all the questions that, that I cannot. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I want to thank the committee. Leslie, for letting us have this meeting here this evening. 
I want to make uh, two uh, very brief statements and then a couple of questions. There are two common sense statements that I would like to just state. One, there are two sides to every story. Very important to any community, any major decision, the two sides. Second, haste makes waste. Now tonight, 2006, there were those who were involved with this issue. 2014, three years ago, we had a number of legislators, including the governor, come behind this effort. But I suspect there are many in this room, probably upwards of 98%, I'm going to throw you a percentage, in the state of Wisconsin, who, like me, knew nothing about this until about, for me, six months ago. Haste makes waste. Now, when we come to the questions, for me, and I know for some people I talk with, some of us have been to Alpena, Michigan. Some of us have talked with the people there. Alpena did a referendum. I believe the number was 1,700 opposed the sanctuary coming in. 700 roughly supported it. Before the referendum, Noah said they would abide by the referendum. They never did that. Second point, the Samoa sanctuary. There is now a legal lawsuit because Noah made a commitment they would not harm in any way the fishing rights of that community. The lawsuit is coming because they are, char they are charging Noah with significant violations of those fishing rights. So when I say there are two sides in every story, I'm going to tell you there are. It's very important for any community, the mayor included, who leads this community to make sure that you've seen and heard and really looked into the two sides. I don't think, in my opinion, that has happened here. Uh, I'm not opposed to a sanctuary, but I am opposed to any procedures that are taken that do not honor the will of the people. Number two, that are not carrying out the promises of any organization that is driving the issue. So I don't know what you want to say with, with the comments I'm making, but those are my concerns. So thank you for that. Um, and I wanted to say also that um, Many of the concerns that we've heard, um, you mentioned the, the timeline and being made aware of this in the, in the past couple of months. Um, so many of the comments that we've heard, I think that I've heard, also are in the public record for during the comment period. So many did get in there um, and not all. I, I, um, so one way to, to see that is the online, the comments are there, they're, they're still available online. So there's a way to get through there and, and see what the comments were, uh, what the concerns were as well. Um, I think for the, the referendum question, again, that was before my time. Um, so Reed may be able to speak to that. I, I think um, that referendum, um, again, I think I'll let Steve speak to it. I know that ultimately um, the state of Michigan and NOAA came to an arrangement that I think reflected many of the concerns that were in that um, referendum and that the MOU that evolved from that was actually had, was very detailed in addressing, I think, many of the concerns that probably were in the community at that time. Um, that doesn't solve the question about how do you deal with a community's referendum, um, which is a good one. Um, but I think that's, that's what I know about the, the referendum. Steve, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, my memory is pretty sketchy on it, but uh, we do have the, the MOBs, which, you know, as I was concerned was that divers could always dive the wrecks. 
So there has been no problem with that, that we'd never be charged a fee. And I don't know where this fishing thing is what, that you're talking about. I've not heard anything. You said something's coming down, but one of the MOBs in there was that no one really has no regulation on the fishing. That's all state. Um, there, there is, uh, there's a federal fishing science group there, right next door to NOAA. But I don't think they have anything to do but research there. So I, I haven't heard anything about what you're talking about. I certainly have. We have a fishing delegate on our advisory council. Um, it, nothing that that person has ever brought up. So I, I don't know of any kind of thing like that unless you can shed some light on that. You say it's coming, but I don't know of any kind of violations because we, we just don't do anything with fishing. You know, I mean, it's, it's, it's only about wrecks. So I, I don't know how you would, would get that. Um, so we do, uh, the, the person sort of working on this uh, also full time is, is Ellen Brody. And Ellen was there for that, that period in time in Alpena. So I'd like to, if, if you'd like, get you connected with Ellen to help answer some of those questions. And she, she was there through the whole period, Steve knows her well, um, to, to talk a little bit about, about that. I, the, the bigger question the clearly that you're asking is, you know, do we carry out the promises we make? Can we carry out those promises? How do, how do we do that? Um, a, a really important point, I think, is the, the Sanctuary Advisory Council. So as that we're moving through managing a National Marine Sanctuary, that the community is there throughout. I can speak mostly about, and really only about, Thunder Bay. And I think um, beyond the referendum period, I don't believe there's been a, a really contentious issue uh, in the city over, over 17 years. So it, if, if there had been, it, it was worked out, but I think it's evolved um, pretty nicely, um, the, the referendum issue notwithstanding. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make a distinction um, between what you might see in a marine system and in the Great Lakes. In, in the Great Lakes, the state has jurisdiction to the state line or the international line, depending on which, which body of water. Lake Michigan happens to be entirely within, within the United States, so the state of Wisconsin has jurisdiction to the state line all the way around, whereas in a marine system, the state or territory only has a defined, um, a, a narrowly defined uh, jurisdiction. And that may be where some of the conflict could arise, um, it, like in American Samoa, but, um, but the state has direct jurisdiction all the way to the state line or the international line. No, I was just going to mention two things. First, I won't go into fishery law issues, but I know a lot about the American Samoa issue that you're raising, so I'm happy to talk with you afterwards. It actually doesn't have anything to do with the sanctuary um, whatsoever. It has to do with the Fishery Management Council and uh, the, the state water lights, but it is nothing to do actually with the sanctuary, and I'm happy to walk you through that. Um, the other issue I just think it's important to point out is when we look at history, let's look at the complete record. And one of the things that's very important to recognize about what happened in Thunder Bay is after that site was designated and it was initially about 400 and so square miles, it's now over 4,000 square miles. And that's because after this happened, the folks recognized the benefits. They saw the trust that they could have in NOAA in terms of management. And it was a very community-based process that led to exp its expansion. Um, and there was a lot of support throughout the whole area. So let's think about the complete record when we think about that history, because that history of what happened in Alpena and that expansion and the number of people that wanted to participate and be part of the sanctuary is an important part of how that trust was built and how it shows you things evolved and changed. Okay, thanks for coming. 
Um, I have actually three questions. One of them is how, I know you said that um, NOAA can provide more research or whatever you were talking about with, um, with the Historical Society. What, what is it that this is gonna do for divers that they can't do already? That's my first question. Um, what, what's preventing them from discovering any of this stuff? It's an open body of water that belongs to the public. What, what point is it to help divers? That's the first question. The second question is, um, I believe President Trump has proposed cuts to NOAA. I'm not sure what cuts that involves with, there's a lot of things that NOAA does, I realize. So does that have anything to do with this program at all, the cuts that are involved with NOAA or proposed cuts? And then thirdly, as a landowner on Lake Michigan, I would like to know um, what my rights are as far as when divers are out there, say there's a, say there, there looks to be a projected or a, a, a possible shipwreck that's just about right outside my door and can divers just come up onto my property or what, what is their, what are they prevented from doing and if somebody goes over that line, what is my right as a landowner? Who's controlling that and who do I call if somebody's just coming up on my land? Because I'm right on the water. So that's just a, a big concern of mine. I live on a, a piece of property where there's nobody behind me. Somebody shows up in my backyard, I'm gonna be freaked out. So I need to know what their rights are and what my rights are. If, if I could just, um, the, the access question in terms, um, the, the, the proposed designation would change any, any um, rights of riparian owners. They, they still have exclusive access to the water from the waters, uh, from, from their property line to the ordinary high water. So it, it's, it, it won't change the way the state's access laws are now. Right. Uh, right. Will not. Change. Rights. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It, yeah. So it was still well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so you it you have to keep your feet wet. So, yeah, people can't access between because it's it's within it's it's within state statute and it's it's providing a clear overlay of of authorities and and that that concept of shared responsibility. It, it won't change the nature of ownership. They won't change. Yeah. But in it, 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 the same, the same, the same way, the same way it's, it's it, the authorities enforced now. If somebody you, is somebody is with, is on your property, you, you're within your rights to, to inform them, to call the sheriff's department, call the police department. And um, basically, divers act, are going to have access to these wrecks and are going to continue to access these wrecks from the water. It's just easier. Um, it's simpler. Um, uh, as all of you know, there are, there are uh, specific access points along Lake Michigan, public access points. They're clearly marked. Um, the Coastal Management Program a few years ago did a publication for that. So folks are going to access these wrecks, they're going to go to a harbor, they're going to get on a charter boat or their own boat, and they're going to go out and dive on them from the water. And traditionally that's what they've done, and we haven't seen any changes in that to this point in time, and we don't anticipate doing that. Um, what we are going to do on, our, in, uh, on, uh, on the website and stuff is emphasize that fact that they need to access these wrecks from the water, and we're going to make clear that um, 
that there are public access points along the beach, and we're going to emphasize that if they want to, for some reason, um, swim out to these from the shore, that they use those access points. So Chair, riparian rights will not change. John, would you at least address the why, what is the extra advantage of having NOAA resources in this, in this search for wrecks? I, I think that's the question. Why, why, yeah, that was the other question. Well, again, um, you know, we, we, we have, over the years, worked very closely with divers. We have maritime enthusiasts who, who hang on um, every word of our technical reports, um, and, and that's great. Um, but our audience is much, much broader than that. And so, um, and we have a responsibility to um, effectively manage these wrecks. And, um, we're concerned that we don't know enough about all of these wrecks. We don't know where they are, and we don't know how they're changing and being affected over the years. So we would like that additional information so that we can better manage these wrecks. And also, as, as technology improves and we can um, pinpoint these wrecks more closely with, with, with GPS, global positioning materials, we think we can make that information available both to um, commercial fishermen and sport fishermen and uh, facilitate them in the fact that they won't get their next nets tangled in those. So we think there's a, there's a lot of practical aspects about getting this, getting better information on those wrecks and where they're located. Um, thank you for having this panel this evening. There are obviously a lot of questions from people. Thank you, Leslie. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, a, just a couple of statements. One is I realize that um, divers are, very, are a very important part of our world, but they are less than 1% of the population of the United States. I'm one of the 99% that does not dive. How does this make this accessible to me? And why would the government put this kind of energy and money into something that less than 1% of our entire population can enjoy? And I don't want to talk about museums and looking at videos and, and that sort of thing. I'm talking about actually enjoy. Um, my next question is, uh, someone mentioned that Russ had visited with 1,300 people. Is that what I heard? Yeah. 1,300 people throughout the process of, Correct. of meeting. 1,300 people, I'm the numbers gal, I'm sorry, you're not <laughs> going to like this at all. I'm trying to keep track too. 1,300 people. Uh, Wisconsin has 5.8 million people in it. You visited two one hundredths of a percent of the population of the state that has jurisdiction to the middle of the lake on the bottomland. I don't think this is a fair representation of how the state really feels, regardless of what the governor feels. I voted for the governor, but I don't care for his decision or his feelings about this. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say was um, that you said NOAA keeps their promises, and I'm sure they keep many of them. But if you do go back into those letters um, from the portal, uh, there are a couple of divers who mentioned Alpena, Michigan, and said they would not support and do not support this sanctuary because they said NOAA is no longer maintaining the buoys for divers. That apparently maintaining the buoys is a big part of what NOAA says they will do when they preserve the shipwrecks or protect them. We're not even sure what NOAA is protecting them from because NOAA did no studies to tell us what they're being protected from. Um, I appreciate your time tonight. Uh, the last thing I want to say, I'm sorry, I'm kind of windy here. Um, I, I do appreciate a lot of the things that NOAA does in, in, this, in this country. I think they provide a lot of education for young people, and I think they do a splendid job. I hope they come to Wisconsin, and I hope they do the same thing. But I do not want NOAA putting a legally restrictive area around 1,200 square miles of Lake Michigan and controlling it. 
they're welcome to do all they want with our kids and educating our, our adults and working with the Wisconsin Historical Society, but stay out of the lake. Thank you. Yeah. So, so I got a, there's a long list here. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> so I wanted to just get back to the ordinary high water mark because I think that discussion kind of went all over the place. So we that is a um, I've, we've heard that before. So we need to make clear in our final rule what we mean by that boundary. So we chose the ordinary high water mark because it's the same. It's a DNR uh, regulatory boundary, and it's the same one the state of Wisconsin uses to to manage their shipwrecks. So that's why we chose it. In that, we, we need to be clear that it doesn't change repairing rights, that people need to keep their feet wet, that a, a diver can't pull up on your beach, all of the things that occur right now. We need to be clear about that. Um, so I appreciate that. And that, that's something we, we definitely do because we don't have an interest in, in changing that, 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 that status quo. Uh, I'm going to keep going, and then I see a lot of hands in the back. Um, the, the idea of um, you know, demonstrating a threat to these places, that, you know, a threat is, is part of it, and the, the report um, that we go back to is the 2008 report that was done by the Wisconsin Historical Society that identified areas of Wisconsin that could be um, good for national marine sanctuaries, could benefit for national marine sanctuaries, form of protection, which is more than just a, um, a single regulation. Um, it really is this comprehensive idea of getting at what, what you said about the, the education um, and the other things that, that NOAA does well. And I, I think that that is the package for a National Marine Sanctuary. It, it is not about um, only for divers, and that is certainly not it, and, and, but that is the, the proposal and the way that we view resource protection, and I think this is the value added that the, that the state sees, is exactly what, what you described, to be, make sure that, there's a great line by the state of Wisconsin within their statute, which is the, the resources um, on the lake bed here are held in trust by the state of Wisconsin for the public, for the residents of Wisconsin. Uh, that, and again, that's only a small percentage that go diving. Everybody else isn't going diving. So John's described some of the ways they reach and try and get a public benefit uh, to a broader audience. That's the same idea that NOAA has on, uh, on a national scale. So can we figure out a way to have public benefit from these beyond the divers? Um, I would encourage people to investigate and look into Alpena, and I, I would be happy to facilitate a visit or dialogues with educators, uh, city managers, economic development folks, what, whatever you choose, to find out if, if in that idea of resource protection is, is, is working there. Um, the outreach question, you're right. Um, only one person, drive, you know, the idea with this is to, to there is an administrative process for this designation, which is the process that we're in. It, it's defined, it's the one that um, is, is spelled out in the National Marine Sanctuaries Act. Beyond that, um, you know, I'm here on, on a detail to be part of this process to do as much outreach a, as we can to facilitate, you know, to help with something like this and, and get where we can. But point well taken that, that that's a small percentage, but that's part of the outreach in the communities that are sort of impacted the most by this. The really important part there is is the the state partnership. I mean, I there isn't a mechanism to reach everybody, but I, I absolutely take your point. So from Noah's perspective, that state partnership is really critical because that's um, in the community partnerships. And we have a community working group where all of the the local folks that are on that group are aware of the say, for instance, the management plan or how the proposal is coming together, so that they are aware of what's going on. And so. For us, that's our connection to the community. Uh, through the state, it's, it's kind of the same idea because we can't get out and talk to everybody in the state of Wisconsin. So partnering with the state is, is that piece. Um, and I, I think, oh, I, somebody earlier had mentioned uh, budget cuts. Um, and so th currently they, they don't. Uh, there is an executive order that, um, that affects new designations that ask for sort of an energy evaluation in new designations, and we don't have complete guidance on how that would affect this process. So, Steve, do you have something else? Uh, I, I don't know. The question about the buoys uh, that she had, um, Noah may 
NOAA is maintaining these buoys very well. I, I charter boat off the <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, as a, I just retired from the charter boat diving thing. As of sort of this year, I still dabble with it a little bit. Uh, there's absolutely no problem with them maintaining the buoys. It's been a fantastic deal. I, I do even volunteer a little bit and do a couple of them myself, put them on and, and help maintain them. So I, I, I don't know where the, the, those divers are or who they are, but if they have a problem, they just call the, call the office and somebody will be out there to repair it. I mean, we have had some go into disrepair. Um, <laughs> things break or whatever, but. Um, I'll just make, I'll make a couple of quick comments. Um, most of the buoys in this area um, that are currently put out on a regular basis are put out by volunteers who work with us and do that. Um, we're very thankful for their help. Um, we, we look forward to working with them. Um, we don't see any change in that. Um, we hope to add some additional buoys and, 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 and um, uh, do, do it in a way that um, we can refine their location. Um, and just to your point, uh, we, we have really, honestly, we really have been talking to people in this area um, since maybe 2008, um, we really have talked to any group um, that would that would have us come and talk to them, and, and we've been actively um, putting information online and in the papers. So um, I think we all recognize that um, um, no matter um, how attentive you are and how closely you watch things, there are some things that you that um, um, might escape your notice or you might be not cognizant of, but uh, it, the, 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 this, in all honesty, we really have worked on this and NOAA has had staff in the state actively since 2008 um, talking to people and working with these folks, as Mike can tell you. So um, we, we, um, we know we didn't reach everybody, um, but this is part of the process and talking to people is also part of this process as we go forward. There was also a comment she made about that only 1% of the people are divers. Thank you. Um, my name is Ron Detroit. I'm a property owner south of the city of Sheboygan. And I was going to come this evening to ask one simple question, and that is how you define the west boundary of the sanctuary. Because as a property owner, I'm concerned about that being a definite answer. And I've heard some earlier comments that makes it kind of arbitrary, and you're asking me to trust you. You know, and, and I think that whatever you're doing here, when you put together an irrevocable sanctuary, I would think that definition should be very clear, and it also should be irrevocable, because for the taxes we pay along the lake there and the privilege we have to help keep it clean and take care of it, I'd like to make sure that that's not, not misunderstood. And along that line, I'm just asking myself, if this is really about shipwrecks, and the shipwrecks are out in the lake, why couldn't we arbitrarily make that west boundary 500 feet east of the wet, wet boundary? Um, just, just to say, I think that might resolve the questions on the whole part of a lot of people here this evening. I think, you know, I've seen you go to the cities, to the municipalities, to coddle those for the last eight years or so to get their support, as well as my governor, who I appreciate very much, but for them to sell out my property rights along the lake to an arbitrary boundary that you asked me just to trust you in concerns me. And I think if you want to do yourself some help and make this thing work, the easiest thing to do would be to move that boundary out in the lake where the shipwrecks are. And, and I think you satisfy. <laughs> All right, um, we, the, uh, we chose the uh, lakeside boundary as the ordinary high water mark. Well, it, it, just, just, we chose the lakeside boundary, you, well, you, had, you said there was some confusion. We chose the, the uh, lakeside boundary as the ordinary high water mark because it's a current regulatory boundary. It marks the boundary between uh, your property and uh, publicly owned bottomland. Um, it is, in most cases, pretty clearly defined. Now, we know that there have been instances where the ordinary high water mark has been discussed at some, in some length, um, but we think it's, 
it's pretty clearly defined in most cases. We think it's something that people can clearly understand. And um, we also think that there are, a, there are a number of shipwrecks that occur um, at the edge of the ordinary high water mark and on the beaches. And so um, that's why we're concerned. Well, we, we, can, we, can, take, we okay. can take you up to Point Beach and we can show you wrecks there. We also should keep in mind that um, as, as we went forward, we, we, we talked about shipwrecks in this because we know a lot about them and we could clearly demonstrate they're nationally significant. But we also know that there are a lot of wrecks out there where we don't know their location and um, so we don't want to exclude that. Excuse me, sir. You were not. You were not up. Okay. I, there so are many answer. people here that want to have questions, and we have a limited amount of time. I'm going to take this gentleman's question because he's been waiting for a while. I had a similar question. Is what he had. In, is why does that have to come? Why does that sanctuary have to come up to the shoreline to that high water mark? There's no sense of that. You can keep it offshore. 20, 30 feet, you'd, or 500. 500 would be a stretch because I know there's a lot of them are closer than that. But there's no reason to come up to that shoreline. None whatsoever. Is there a good answer for that? Um, the complete de definition of a sanctuary resource, which parallels the state definition, is items of archaeological and historical interest, including to, including, uh, but not limited to shipwrecks. And this, this is the idea that there are historic resources that are not shipwrecks, but are archaeologically important. So that's, that's why that definition is the way it is. So completely understand and take your point. Well, it's so the ordinary, for the reasons John described, we chose the ordinary high water mark because it's the existing one that, that sort of makes sense as a landward boundary because there could be things in that, in that area. Um, the water line itself has been suggested, and of course that moves in and out, so that, that's a tough one. Um, I own property in Lake Huron uh, in the sanctuary. Um, no conflict there. Steve, you're also a landowner in the sanctuary. So, again, I'm just offering an example of 17 years of, of, of no conflict. The ordinary high water, we don't want to change anything in there. So we, we don't want to change the way you, you use it, um, the way you have exclusive repairing rights. It is a, it is a boundary that tracks with the straight um, definition of, of the landward boundary. So, so that's why we, we chose it. And we want to make it clear that it won't impact those rights. And I, I think we can do that in, in the definition because there is potential that, you know, John has done work on, on Native American sites, which, you know, there's high potential for those to occur in that area. Th those are the reasons why the ordinary high water mark makes sense if you're managing more than just shipwrecks, which this proposal uh, proposes to do. Sure. One more question here. Mm -hmm. Good evening, my name is John Pleasitz. I'm a lifelong resident of Sheboygan. Um, I'd like to find out through a show of hands, how many people in this room tonight do not support the NOAA project? Can I see a show of hands? Those that do not support the NOAA project. I think that pretty much tells you how we feel here. Lake Michigan is a very important body of water to all of its residents. Uh, the fact that I've chose not to relocate after I graduated from college was mainly because I wanted to live near Lake Michigan. I spend a lot of my time on Lake Michigan. Fishing and hunting has, has been my pastime. And I'm quite concerned about any governmental agency taking control of our waterway. And I'm not in favor of it. This, this is the second meeting that I've attended. I also attended one at the uh, UW Center. And through much uh, of the things that I heard in both of these meetings, we're only hearing uh, from one side. 
i offered a suggestion at the last meeting to have a debate somebody from no law represents your point of view we can find somebody who has an opposing point of view and i can think of one person off hand that would probably be more than happy to to uh spearhead uh his side of the argument that has never been in the interest of noah to do that nor do i think you want to do that but that's what i'd like to see i'd like to see somebody discussing the pros and the cons of having this project go through it is too important a project for us to relinquish our water rights and only hear one side Thank you. Thank you for that comment. This proposal doesn't include relinquishing um, water rights, or it, it, it doesn't. I mean, it, it does not. And it's okay when the, when the show of hands with, with folks that oppose it, um, that's okay. We don't expect everybody is going to be in agreement on it. Um, but we do want to make sure it's clear with what we're doing. And that's part of this. You're right. There isn't a debate baked into this administrative process that we're on to do this, that started in, in 2008. But we're here tonight to listen to that. And uh, again, I guess it's not a debate, but it is an attempt to hear what, uh, what the concerns are. So but I want to be really clear, and Chris mentioned this, that you know, giving up rights isn't, isn't part of the, the, pro the proposal. Can I ask you a question? Sure can. I don't know. So that is a, that's a, it is a good, there is currently not language in the National Marine Sanctuaries Act that allows for a sanctuary to be de-designated. Um, and that's, that, that's the straight truth because that's a question I asked as well very recently. Um, we've never been asked that question before. Um, I, I, and I'm, again, I'm here to be honest. So we, we haven't been asked that question before through the sanctuary advisory councils, you know, we have got to the point where a sanctuary would, would need or want to be revoked. So there's ways, particularly in state waters, there's an MOA that describes conflict resolution and those other pieces. It, it, it is okay. important, and I'm, and I'm being honest, that the, the way it's managed now is to not get to that point through pieces like the sanctuary advisory council and an MOA. Anyway. I, I thank you all for coming. Actually, There's, can okay, I well, add to that last one? Um, yeah. They can, uh, through a process that I described earlier uh, at the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary. All right. I, there, you may stay afterwards and speak to any members of the panel. I'm going to call...